ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮದನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಧೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮ and we're continuing with the instructions that Lord Chaitanya gave to Rupa Goswami it's in the 19th chapter of the Madhya Leela of the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita and i'm going to take up a little further along than we were last time because um the instructions that shri chaitanya mahaprabhu gives to rupa goswami begin at text number 136 pardon me prabhu kahe shuna rup bhakti ra shera lakhan sutra rupe kahi bishtarna jaya varana shri chaitanya mahaprabhu said my dear rupa please listen to me it is not possible to describe devotional service completely therefore i am just trying to give you a synopsis of the symptoms of devotional service para para shunya ghabhira bhakti rasa shindu tomai chahaite tar kahi ak bindu the ocean of the transcendental mellows of devotional service is so big that no one can estimate its length and breadth however just to help you taste it i am describing but one drop eti brahmand bhari anant jivagan chaurashi laka yoni te kare brahmana in this universe there are limitless living entities in 8400000 species and all are wandering within this universe purport this is a challenge to so called scientists and philosophers who presume that there are living entities on this planet only so called scientists are going to the moon and they say there's no life there this does not tally with shri chaitanya mahaprabhu's version he says that everywhere within the universe there are unlimited numbers of living entities in 8400000 different forms in the bhagavad gita 2.24 we find that the living entities are sarvagata which means that they can go anywhere this indicates that there are living entities everywhere they exist on land in water in air in fire and in ether thus there are living entities in all types of material elements since the entire material universe is composed of five elements earth water fire air and ether why should there be living entities on one planet and not on others such a foolish version can never be accepted by vedic students from the vedic literatures we understand that there are living entities on each and every planet regardless of whether the planet is composed of earth water fire or air these living entities may not have the same forms that are found on this planet earth but they have different forms composed of different elements even on this earth we can see that the forms of land animals are different from the forms of aquatics according to the circumstance living entities differ but undoubtedly there are living entities everywhere why should we deny the existence of living entities in this or that planet those who have claimed to have gone to the moon have not gone there or else with their imperfect vision they could can, they cannot actually perceive the particular type of living entities there the living entities are described as ananta or unlimited nonetheless they are said to belong to 8400000 species as stated in the vishnu purana jalaja navalakshani stavara laksha vinshati krimayo rudra sankhya ka pakshinam dasha lakshanam trimsha lakshani pashava chatur lakshani manushaha there are 900000 species living in the water there are also 2 million non moving living entities stavara such as trees and plants there are also 1,100,000 species of insects and reptiles 
and there are 1,000, excuse me, 1 million species of birds. As far as quadrupeds are concerned, there are 3 million varieties, and there are 400,000 human species. Some of these species may exist on one planet and not on another, but in any case, within all the planets of the universe, and even in the sun, there are living entities. This is the verdict of the Vedic literatures. As the Bhagavad Gita 2.20 confirms, Najayate mriyate vakada chindayam bhutva bhavitava nabhuyaha Ajo nitya shashvato yam porano nahanyate hanyamane sharire For the soul there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever-existing, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. Since the living entities are ever, excuse me, are never annihilated, they simply transmigrate from one life form to another. Thus, there is an evolution of forms according to the degree, degree of developed consciousness. One experiences different degrees of consciousness in different forms. A dog's consciousness is different from a man's. Even within a species, we find that a father's consciousness is different from his son's and that a child's consciousness is different from a youth's. Just as we find different forms, we find different states of consciousness. When we see different states of consciousness, we take it for granted that the bodies are different. In other words, different types of bodies depend on different states of consciousness. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 8.6. Yang yang vapis manan bhavam tajat yante kalevaram tam tam evaite konteya sadatad bhava bhavitaha. One's consciousness at the time of death determines one's type of body in the next life. This is the process of transmigration of the soul. A variety of bodies is already there. We change from one body to another in terms of our consciousness. So one person in this life is thinking I'm a man and other person's thinking I'm, I'm a woman. But in a previous life, the man may have been a woman and the woman may be a, 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 been a man. Very possible, actually. We just uh, read the uh, chapter in the Japanese class about how Purunjana became a woman in his next life. He was a king and he was very attached to his wife at a time of death. He was in anxiety of how will my children be supported, how will my wife be okay, and everything like that. And so he was fully meditating on his wife at the time of death. And then he became the daughter of King Vidarbha, and his name was Vidarbi. So he became uh, a woman in his next life. And then he married... <laughs> Someone came along and married him. So it, it just interesting how um, the bodies are are always changing in this world according to the state of consciousness. Actually, in the eighth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, there's a very definitive definition of karma, which is helpful to understand the process of changing bodies according to consciousness. And it comes in the... Eighth chapter, and um, the verse is number. If you got something to say, say it loud. I can't hear you. Three. Okay. So Krishna says, "Aksharam Brahma Paramam Subhavo Dhyatma Uchite Bhuta Bhavo Bhavakoro Visarga Kama Karma Sangjita." And um, so the Supreme Personality of God had said the indestructible transcendental living, living entity is called Brahman and his eternal nature is called Adhyatma, the self. Action pertaining to the development of the material bodies of the living entities is called karma or fruit of activities. So I'll point out the last sentence in this verse. Action pertaining to the development of the material bodies of the living entities is called karma or fruit of activities. This is in Sanskrit, visarga karma sankitaha. So in the uh, purport, Prabhupada says, Brahman is indestructible and eternally existing, and its constitution is not changed at any time. But beyond Brahman, there is para-Brahman. Brahman refers to the living entity, and, and para-Brahman refers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
The constitutional position of the living entity is different from the position he takes in the material world. In material consciousness, his nature is to try to, lord, to be the lord of matter. But in spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness, his position is to serve the supreme. When the living entity is in material consciousness, he has to take on various bodies in the material world. Now, this is the sentence I'd like to bring to your attention. This is called karma or varied creation by the force of material consciousness. This relates to the topic at hand. Again, this is called karma or varied creation by the force of material consciousness. I'll say, please repeat. This is called karma or varied creation by the force of material consciousness. This is the secret to transmigration of the soul. We're being forced by material consciousness. And there are varied creations because there's varied kinds of consciousness. That's called karma. So in this first uh, section, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was pointing out the 8,400,000 species of life. And we heard a verse from the uh, Puranas. This is from the Vishnu Purana describing exactly how many species there are in each life. And you can just look around and see the varieties. S yes, Sudhi. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Where are the microphones? No, I'll repeat until they ring. Go ahead. Um, is it that the actions that one performs during his lifetime? Is it the action that one actions that one performs during one's lifetime? that leads to a predominant thought at the time of death. Usually, yes. That's why uh, you better be careful. You know, that's why we practice while we're in this life, thinking of Krishna, acting for Krishna, and so forth. Because there's a tendency to, um, I mean, garbage in, garbage out, right? They say. And if, if you're used to he hearing all kinds of uh, material sounds, then that's what will be going around in your head. And generally, the, at, at a time of helplessness, if you're used to just being swept away by the mind anyway, then that's what will come into your consciousness when you're in a helpless situation. Hare Krishna. Okay. And, and uh, however, in the Sri Upanishad, in the verse number 17, Vayur anilam amritam atedam bhashman tam sharinam om krato smara kritam smara krato smara kritam smara Oh my Lord, um, let this temporary body be burnt to ashes and let the air of life be merged with the totality of air. Now, oh my Lord, please remember all my sacrifices and because you are the ultimate beneficiary, please remember all that I have done for you. Prabhupada points out that even if, one's, uh, if one has dedicated one's life to, the, to serving Krishna, thinking of Krishna, and somehow or other is not able to th think of him at the time of death, the critical point, then Krishna is very merciful, and he helps the devotee to remember him. One more uh, <clears throat> question, Brody. Yes. So there are four uh, lakhs of species in the human being. So how do we distinguish the four lakhs of species? Is there considered just in the earth or in the earth no, itself? No, Prabhupada said it in the purport. He said in planets all over the universe. And so we're one tiny little speck, this one planet in the universe. So there's All the human beings in the earth maybe kind of a one, that means? Or? Not necessarily. But Prabhupada, when asked this question, was a little nondescript. And I don't know, I haven't found any exact evidence that defines precisely what determines one species from another of human beings. Text number 139. Keshagra shateka bhaga puna shatam shakari tarsham shukshma jivera swarup vichari. The length and breadth of the living entity is described as one ten thousandth part of the tip of a hair. This is the original subtle nature of the living entity. Keshagra shatabhagasya shatamsha sadrishatmakaha jiva sukshma swarupoyam sankitito hichitkanaha. 
If we divide the tip of a hair into a hundred parts and then take one of these parts and divide it again into a hundred parts, that very fine division is a size of but one of the numberless living entities. They are all chitkana, particles of spirit, not matter. Purport, this is quoted from the commentary on the portion of Srimad Bhagavatam wherein the Vedas personified offer their obeisances under the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Krishna confirms this statement in Bhagavad Gita 15.7. Mamai vamsho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatanaha. The living entities in this conditioned world are my eternal fragmental parts. Lord Sri Krishna personally identifies himself with the minute living entities. Lord Krishna is the supreme spirit, the super soul, and the living entities are his very minute parts and parcels. Of course, we cannot divide the tip of a hair into such fine particles, but spiritually such small particles can exist. Spiritual strength is so powerful that a mere atomic portion of, a, of spirit can be the biggest brain in the material world. The same spiritual spark is within an ant and within the body of Brahma. According to his karma, material activities, the spiritual spark attains a certain type of body. Material activities are carried out in goodness, passion, and ignorance, or a combination of these. According to the mixture of the modes of material nature, the living entity is awarded a particular type of body. This is the conclusion. Pretty clear, right? Yeah. Balagra shatabhagasya shatadha kalpitasya cha bhago jiva savignaya iti chaha parashutihi if we divide the tip of a hair into 100 parts and then take one part and divide this into another 100 parts, that 10,000th part is the dimension of the living entity. This is the verdict of the chief Vedic mantras. Purport, the first three padas in this verse from the Panchadashi Chitra Deep are taken from the Shweta Shvataru Upanishad. Sukshmanam apyaham jiva. Lord Sri Krishna says, among minute particles, I am the living entity. Purport, the living entity is one with and different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As spirit soul, the living entity is one in quality with the Supreme Lord. However, the Supreme Lord is bigger than the biggest, and the living entity is smaller than the smallest. This quotation is the third pada of a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam 11.16.11. Aparamita dhruvas tanubrito yadi sarvagatas tarhina shashyateti niyamo dhruva nitarita anjanicha yan mayam tad avimucha nirantir bhavet samam anu janatam yad amantam mata dushtataya. This is a verse from the prayers of the personified Vedas, which disproves the idea of, of Mayavad. One of the best verses for it, and it's quoted in many places. O Lord, although the living entities who have accepted material bodies are spiritual and unlimited in number, if they were all pervading, there would be no question of their being under your control. If they are accepted, however, as particles of the eternally existing spiritual entity, as part of you, who are the supreme spirit whole, we must conclude that they are always under your control. If the living entities are simply satisfied with being identical with you as spiritual particles, then they will be happy being controllers of so many things. The conclusion is that the living entities and the Supreme Personality of Godhead are one and the same is faulty conclusion. This, it is not a fact. So basically, if you were God, you wouldn't be under control. <laughs> and prove you're not being controlled. <laughs> It's ludicrous to assume that you're not. And uh, therefore, the Supreme Controller never comes under control of anyone else. So the living entity, although the same in uh, quality as the Supreme Lord, in quantity is tiny and he is great. He's the controller and we're the controlled. Text 144. Tarma de stavara jangama dui bait. Jangame tirek jal stala chala bi bait. If you're online, we welcome you to the broadcast. And if you'd like to make a text message, 
It's 650-245-7018. That's 650-245-7018. Please join us by texting in because we'd love to hear from you. The unlimited living entities can be divided into two divisions, those that can move and those that cannot move. Among living entities that can move, there are birds, aquatics, and animals. Purport, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was giving clear instructions on how the living entities live under different conditions. There are trees, plants, and stones that cannot move, but still they must be considered living entities or spiritual sparks. The soul is present in bodies like those of trees, plants, and stones. They are all living entities. Among moving living entities such as birds, aquatics, and animals, the same spiritual spark is there. As stated herein, there are living entities that can fly, swim, and walk. We must also conclude that there are living entities that can move within fire and ether. Living entities have different material bodies composed of earth, water, fire, and ether. The words Tara Madhye means within this universe. The entire material universe is composed of five material elements. It is not true that living entities reside only within this planet and not within others. Such a conclusion is completely contradictory to the Vedas. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita 2.24, Achedyo yam adahyo yam akledyo shosha evacha nityak sarvakatak stahanur acholo yam sanatanaha This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. The soul has nothing to do with the material elements. Any material element can be cut into pieces, except especially earth. <clears throat> as far as the living entity is concerned, however, he can be neither burned nor cut to pieces. He can therefore live within fire. We can, we can conclude that there are also living entities within the sun. Why should living entities be denied this planet or that planet? According to the Vedas, the living entities can live anywhere and everywhere, on land, in water, in air, and in fire. Whatever the conclusion, the living entity is unchangeable, stahanu. From the statements of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Bhagavad Gita, we are to conclude that living entities exist everywhere throughout the universes. They are distributed as trees, plants, aquatics, birds, human beings, and so on. Text 145. Tarmadye manusya jati ati alpatra. Alpatara. Tarmadye mlecha pulinda bhoda shabhar. Although the living entities known as human beings are very small in quantity, that division may still be further subdivided, for there are many uncultured human beings like mlechas, pulindas, bhodas, and shabharas. Veda Nishta Madhye Ardeka Veda Muki Mane Veda Nishida Papakari Dharma Nahigani. Among human beings there are followers of the Vedic principles. <clears throat> Among human beings, those who are followers of the Vedic principles are considered civilized. Among these, almost half simply give lip service while committing all kinds of sinful activities against these principles. Such people do not care for the regulative principles. Veda Nishtamadhyay means among persons who are followers of the Vedas. They're fixed in the Vedas. They're Veda Nishta and, and Madhyay among those. Ardeki, Ardeka, almost half. Veda, Vedic literatures, Muke, in the mouth. Mane, except. <laughs> Just they accept it by, by lip service, as probably translate this. Uh, Veda Nishada, forbid in the Vedas, Papa sins, Kari performs. So they perform all kinds of sinful activities and they just talk about being part of the Vedic culture. Dharma Nahe Gani. So among human beings, there are the followers of the Vedas. Vedic principles are considered civilized. Among these, almost half simply give lip service by com while committing all kinds of sinful activities against these principles. Such people do not care for the regulative principles. They give lip service. The word Veda means knowledge. Supreme knowledge consists of understanding the Supreme Personality of Godhead and our relationship with Him and acting according to that relationship. Action in accordance with the Vedic principles is called religion. 
Religion means following the orders of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Vedic principles are the injunctions given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Aryans are civilized human beings who have been following the Vedic principles since time immemorial. No one can trace out the history of the Vedic principles set forth so that man might understand the Supreme Being. Literature or knowledge that seeks the Supreme Being can be accepted as a bona fide religious system, but there are many different types of religious systems according to the place, the, the disciples, and the person's capacity to understand. The highest type of religious system is described in Srimad Bhagavatam 126. Thus, Savai Pumsam Paro Dharmo Yato Bhakti Radhoksaje. The highest form of religion is that by which one becomes fully conscious of the existence of God, including his form, name, qualities, pastimes, abode, and all pervasive features. When everything is completely known, that is the perfection of Vedic knowledge. The fulfillment of Vedic knowledge is systematic knowledge of the characteristics of God. This is confirmed by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, 1515. Vedaishya sarveraham eva vedya. The aim of Vedic knowledge is to understand God. Therefore, those who are actually following Vedic knowledge and searching after God cannot commit sinful activities against the Supreme Lord's order. However, in this age of Kali, Although men profess to belong to so many different kinds of religions, most of them commit sinful activities against the orders of the Vedic scriptures. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore says herein, Veda nishada papakari dharma nahigani. In this age, men may profess a religion, but they actually do not follow the principles. Instead, they commit all kinds of sins. Age of Kali. Bali Dhamardhan Prabhu pointed out the other day some shlokas from the Shastra which point out that in the age of Kali some of the actually demoniac people will be born in Brahmin families and so forth and the whole system gets uh, mixed up. <clears throat> and um, therefore one has to look for the gold standard which is mentioned here that one actually develops love for God. Ahaitukiya Pratiyata Savai Pumsam Paro Dharmo Yato Bhaktira Hok Sajay Haitukiya Pratiyata Yayatma Suprasiditi. If one has uh, unmotivated and uninterrupted service to God, this is considered the, the gold standard, not asking for anything. And Prabhupada points, and also it's un, uninterrupted. There's nothing, uh, uh, not this is for me, that's for God. It's all, con one's life is yukta, or completely connected. And Prabhupada points out here that one should have full knowledge also of all the different categories of God. Not that God's over there. And then there are many philosophies actually that profess that God's separate from, from the creation and so forth. And in the philosophy, the Vedanta and the Bhagavat philosophy, when we understand um, God and his energies are actually uh, one and the same, but different at the same time. And therefore, there's nothing but God. It's Advaya Gyan Tattva. The truth is that everything is God, but there are divisions, and there are higher and lower energies. And these, it's important to know these energies. And ultimately, Krishna describes in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, even though the creation is there and there are all different manifestations of, of uh, God, still he's separate from all of them. And he has his ultimate supreme position. So it's a great science and one must know all the categories uh, of uh, information that relate to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then uh, when one knows perfectly, aham sarvasya prabhavo matak sarvam pabhartate iti matva bhajante mam buddha bhava samanvita. Proof of understanding is that one acts. And uh, what is that action? Krishna says, if one understands how I'm the source of everything and then and everything emanates from me, then he engages in my service with, with full love and attention. That's the proof one's understood, actually. <clears throat> Are you enjoying these purports? Yes. They're right here in the middle of the Madhya Lila. <laughs> yeah, it's a great science, huh? Yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
Prabhuji, in the previous words you were reading that... Uh, Here's how to use the mic. Turn it right towards you. It is on. Point it right at you. There you go. So the previous verse when you were reading among living entities, yeah. like you were saying two classes, one I knew you were going to bring this up. Uh, their stones are, yeah, you know, stones, yeah, exactly. I know, stone I know. is a living entity. There are some, not all stones are living entities, but there are some that actually have some, uh, uh, there have been some stones that have been discovered that have some living features. And Prabhupada also points out in that uh, uh, that uh, there are mountains that are living entities also. That, uh, <clears throat> And he may be referring to that as well. Uh, but, um, it, that is that in, in the Puranas there are descriptions of mountains that actually could fly at certain times Indra cut them down and cut their wings off with his thunderbolt and uh, they're living entities anyway living entity will have the symptoms of a living entity so if you find a stone that has living symptoms you'll know there's a soul in there did you have a question too? Um, Prabhu, you mentioned about the prayers by the personified Vedas, right, some time back. Uh, just was curious, like, what exactly the, it means? The in many times in Prabhupada's books, we see fear personified, Vedas personified. <clears throat> um, how do we understand this? Like, how how can what does fear personified mean? For example, is it you were about to say how has, can dot dot dot? Can you finish that? Question? Uh, okay. How can? Uh, I was uh, wondering what it means when Prabhupada says fear personified. Finish this one sentence. How can? How, how can something? How, how can? can I, I forgot. How what. can the Vedas be personified? How can they yeah. not be personified? Everything's personified. <laughs> Ultimately, everything's personified, and then the, 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 those personifications have their energies. In the, in the material world, we see all kinds of forms and shapes that um, don't have life. Uh, they're dead matter. But in the spiritual world, there is no dead matter. Everything's personified. So I'm used to the material world, but, and when I hear about the spiritual world, it sounds fantastical. But it's not. I mean, it is, in a way, because it, every, there's wonderment at every moment how the spiritual world works. In fact, if one's a little astute and not a dull head and looks at the material world, there's wonderment at every second also. Mm-hmm. At anything you look at, you can just sit there, how did that happen? Who made that? How did it come to being? Or you can just take it for granted. It's, like, eh, it's by chance. Um, in any case, the, these uh, there are personified, living in it, conscious Everything's conscious in the spiritual world. And everything in this material world has its origin in the spiritual world because this is a, a reflection of the, of the spiritual world. So the Vedas are personified. They have their uh, personified forms. Including uh, emotions like fear, anger. Yes. These things would also yes. be personified. Okay. Yeah, they do. And, you know, actually it's intuitive. You see, when you see kids and they... And you tell them, you know, they go to kindergarten and they say, let's draw a picture. They'll put a house and then they'll put a little smile in the house, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember from kindergarten a lot of stuff. And, you know, draw a sun and the sun has a little face and a smile on it, right? Unless they're, you know, they've come from a bad household, then they'll have a little frown. <laughs> and the psychologist will come in and say, you're beating your child. And then, <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> it's sort of a natural... It's a, it's a natural tendency to see everything as personified. But uh, then that sort of gets taught out of people, you know. In, in fact, uh, you know, Native Americans had, had a sense, you know, that there was a, a, a living spirit behind each one of the manifestations of nature and stuff. That's, and it's a fact. That's how it works. And, the, you know, even the, the planets, they're described in Jyotish as living entities. They're actually, there's a, there's a person behind it. It has to be. That's what runs everything. Matter doesn't run itself. It's run by a conscious living entity. That's how it moves. That's how, that's how it expands, manifests, manifests, or has energy or influence. It comes from the energetic, which is a, a conscious person. Another question. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, God and his energies are non-different, right? And also there are different... Uh, They're different and non-different. At the same time. Simultaneously, right. inconceivably, they're one and different at the same time. Right. Uh, is that where 
our uh, vishishta advaita phil i mean sorry uh, chintya bheda vedatva is that where it is different from madhvacharya's dvaita philosophy it's very slightly different yes if you if you study all the uh, various teachings of the acharyas you you'll notice slight differences um and you'll see like from the vishnu swami sampradaya if you read all about their their philosophy of oneness and difference it's very hard to distinguish so there's some subtle differences and yes uh mahaprabhu perfectly encapsulated all of the um various uh, teachings that the vaishnava acharyas gave which were very specifically to distinguish us from the mayavadis they went at great lengths to describe how we we're, were different from god and how we're part of his energy at the same time but chaitanya mahaprabhu gave the most perfect explanation in our opinion as gaudiya vaishnavas okay anything saya comments well, he needs a microphone Can you repeat that? Banuswami when he was there in Tokyo when I was in Tokyo and this topic came up and he was explaining the the subtle differences between uh Madhvacharya's explanation of of God and the difference between uh oneness and difference and uh in in the Madhva teaching they very much stress the difference between God and the and the living entity in the material world and in uh the ramanuja ramanuja sampradaya the shri sampradaya they they're similar uh to chaitanya's they stress that that the ajiva the living entity is simultaneously one and different than god they st- stress a little bit more also the difference and then in the um uh, nimbarka sampradaya they stress more the oneness and but it was chaitanya mahaprabhu who really came out and stressed both of them equally and explained how inconceivably the living in these simultaneous one one in difference and of course the 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 followers of shankara they say absolutely there is only oneness and therefore everything else is an illusion the material world is also an illusion there is only oneness and they they uh, selectively pick from the upanishads to support that position or shankar acharya did neglecting all the other verses in the upanishads that either stress the difference or st- stress uh the oneness they just picked the, the oneness verses so he he said that so i thought i found that interesting thank you that was a excellent contribution <clears throat> and um it's important to to read about these things um especially the difference between uh our philosophy and mayavad philosophy which you can do in the uh adi leela of the chaitanya charanamrita prabhupad goes at great lengths to describe how the different aspects of mayavad are faulty and can, how the arguments fall apart yeah can i add uh, something that's not from our sampradaya that it's something i read uh, recently that my daughter uh, recommended i read cuz she knows i like science and medicine and things so i read a book called uh, proof of heaven recently by a neuroscientist whose name is evan alexander and he's a neuroscientist and his whole life practically his whole career he was absolutely sure uh that consciousness comes from matter that the consciousness that matter is a source of consciousness and then he um uh, he had bacterial meningitis and he went into a coma and most people don't do not survive bacterial meningitis and he had e coli bacterial meningitis which is almost unheard of but anyway so he was in a in a coma for 9 days and he absolutely had no brain activity except for brain stem activity everything else was practically gone and during during his coma he had a near death experience so he went into the spiritual realms 
And he said the first thing that he was very surprised, he had no, he had, usually people that have near-death experiences, they have some sense of their material identity and their loved ones. He had no sense of his material identity. He just had his spiritual identity. And he sensed how um, he could see 360 degrees, he could smell with his eyes, he could see with his ears. <laughs> he was having all these experiences. And then he experienced the presence of God. And he said, he was so amazed because people make this mistake that God is impersonal. And he said, God is the most personal of the persons. And all our humanity, all our human sense is, is coming from God. And he, he experienced... Uh, his oneness with God, but his difference, and how everything, how consciousness was the source of matter. And of course, quantum science is, is confirming this as well, that, that consciousness is what's manipulating matter as opposed to matter manipulating consciousness or being the source of consciousness. So I just throw, I thought I'd throw that in. Thank you. Also proving that bacterial meningitis is not all bad. <laughs> <laughs> No, there, there are, these are important, you know, anecdotal, but they are inspiring nonetheless because people do have these personal experiences and, you know, become transformed and then write about them and so forth. Shraddha. I was going to ask a question of Satyadev Prabhu. That, did he describe the form of the Lord? Like, was he, did he see Krishna? Or? <laughs> no, he, he said that, unfortunately, he couldn't see the face of God. And uh, or actually uh, hear the voice, but he heard like uh, telepathic revelations. But he was absolutely sure that God had a face and that was a person, but uh, just wasn't that part was not revealed. Ganarvika, are you thinking of the same verse from the Ishupanishad? Hiranmayina Patrena? I was just thinking of that when you said. That there's a verse in the Sri Upanishad, one of our scriptures, which describes uh, a devotee's prayer, and he's saying, oh, "My Lord, please remove the effulgence of your trance, so I can see your face." We should send him that verse, <laughs> right? Could you do that? Write him a letter and just send him that verse from the Sri Upanishad. He might like it. I don't know. Gandharviga. No, I was just thinking of Buddha. That, uh, um, person that we met, that how one oh. person has to be developed to even accept the fact. <laughs> yeah. Are you that's thinking of the guy science, the other day? That's fantasy. <laughs> yeah, we met this fellow. We were, we were actually, he's right down across the street. He came here. He came? We, we were here, we finished, and he came here, he was discussing with Ramananda Sakapuru. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Ramananda. <laughs> yeah, so he was just very interested person he was we saw this we were going around an apartment complex across the street and we saw this arm reaching out the door the door was closed but the arm was reaching out because he had a cigarette apparently didn't want to smoke inside the the apartment so he'd like and he'd blow the smoke out and he'd hold the cigarette so I looked down and I pointed to Priya Kishori because we were up above on the balcony I said look at that arm coming out of the door and the devotees had already been by there distributing books and then we heard this voice saying, I have a question. I have a question. So finally we all realized after we were finished distributing that somebody actually had a question. So we went back over there and he was sitting inside the door and he did have a lot of questions. And everything we said, he said, what was that? Everything we said should be Yeah, yeah. And it was, we were left with the feeling that... Um, it take, I like the way you put it. It takes a lot of development to bring people to a certain level. Ramananda, uh, you met this uh, fellow that we met across the street. And then how was that experience? Yeah, he came here. And I don't know whether he's the same person you're referring to, but probably the same person. And uh, he sound, he was very serious and he's interested. his interest is also very serious. And he spent, uh, he talked to me for almost... Uh, uh, half an hour to 45 sure minutes. Sure it's the same person? Yeah, he's wearing the red shirt and he, he tried to give prashadam to say hi to us. He Did he take prashadam? No, he didn't take because he said that he has some um, um, he has some dietary restrictions. So he didn't uh, take prashadam. But, but he did say that uh, he is interested to come here. 
Okay. And uh, Wednesday, he is actually very much interested to come. And Wednesday and Sundays, uh, it's not possible for him because he has some other. Uh, but Saturdays, he said he will come. Okay. That's great. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Thank you very much, Ramananda. In the neighborhood, we were meeting all kinds of, well, neighbors, all our neighbors up and down the street. And uh, we were thinking that we will uh, make a plan to um, make a concentric circle going outward from the temple so we meet everybody in Mountain View before we go much, before we go further, because they can all just walk to the temple. It would be nice. Narendra, you had a question? A point? A comment, okay. Thank you, Ramananda. I, I know one of my friend, and uh, yeah, this is fine. Uh, one of my friend, he, he went into this uh, meditation, etc., and he w went out of his body, and he says, Ki, heaven definitely exists because he went to heaven and then came back into the body. And mm -hmm. he's, he's existing, and he can tell the whole experience. And he says ki, uh, people should be very careful after, after death, and the people who are not good, they can be thrown into, <laughs> into big body or anybody, anybody and uh, he, nobody has a choice. Yeah, it's, the, what you just said is all consistent with, with uh, Shastra. Shastra means scripture. So, and uh, there, are, there are hundreds of, if not thousands, of anecdotal stories about people leaving their body and coming back in. In fact, I think Saidev Prabhu had had experiences with patients who had uh, had that happen to them and not want to come back in their bodies or seeing themselves and remembering and things like that, right? Two out of hundreds. Two out of hundreds. Okay. And we have a text that just came in. Hare Krishna. Yes, yes. I just want to add something that last, uh, last week in CNN, they were um, um, broadcasting this experience, three people who went to this death experience and come back and telling their story. And I was curiously listening, what, what is their experience? Uh, same thing. They're saying they went back and there was Dudas. There's two different pe you know, groups and arguments what you did and based, based upon their activities. And uh, so, you know, they, they, it seems like, uh, you know, uh, their experience is the same thing what we have. Consistent. Yeah. Okay. Hansapriya Mataji on the phone. Hansapriya, yes. Yeah. She was saying the, the person's name is Mark. Mark, it's Mark. 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 Okay, so Bakta Mark. <laughs> Lives across the street and... Um, we're, we welcome him to our community. He's a wonderful person. And he started asking all kinds of really nice questions. And we look forward to seeing him more. Hare Krishna. So we're continuing on text 147 because this is really nice. Dhamma dharma chari madye bahutta karma nishta koti karma nishta madye eka jnani sheshta among the followers of Vedic knowledge, most are following the process of fruit of activity and distinguishing between good and bad work. Out of many such sincere fruit of actors, there may be one who is actually wise. Uh, make a note uh, that that door needs some oil, please. It can be easily fixed. It just needs to be lubricated. Purport, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur states that the word karma nishta refers to one who aspires to enjoy the results of his good work and pious activity. Some followers of Vedic principles offer everything to the absolute truth and do not aspire to enjoy the results of their pious actions. These are also considered among the karma nishtas. Sometimes we see pious men earn money with great hardship and then spend the money for some pious cause by opening public charities, schools, and hospitals. Whether one earns money for himself or for the public benefit, he is called karmanishta. Out of, many, out of millions of karmanishtas, there may be one who is wise. Those who try to avoid fruit of activity and who become silent in order to merge into the spiritual existence of the absolute are generally known as jnanis, wise men. 
They are not interested in fruit of activity, but in merging into the supreme. In either case, both the karmanishtas and the jnanis are interested in personal benefit. The karmis are directly interested in personal benefit within the material world, and the jnanis are interested in merging into the existence of the supreme. The jnanis maintain that fruit of activity is imperfect. For them, perfection is the cessation of work and the merging into the supreme existence. That is their goal of life. The jnanis want to extinguish the distinction between knowledge, the knower, and the aim of knowledge. This philosophy is called monism or oneness and is characterized by spiritual science. So then there are people who follow the Vedas, but then they, um, they either want to enjoy the uh, results that they get from performing pious activities or they want to extinguish their existence altogether and opt out of the material world in a way that's um, unnatural. Koti jnani madhye hoy eka jana mukta. Koti mukta madhye dhulab ek krishna bhakto. Out of many millions of such wise men, one may actually become liberated, mukta. And out of many millions of such liberated persons, a pure devotee of Lord Krishna is very difficult to find. Purport in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.2.32, it is said that due to their poor fund of knowledge, the jnanis are not actually liberated. They simply think that they are liberated. The perfection of knowledge culminates when one comes to the platform of knowing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan iti shabdite. The absolute truth, satya vastu, is described as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Knowledge of impersonal Brahman and the Supersoul is imperfect until one comes to the platform of knowing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is therefore clearly said in this verse, Koti Mukta Madhye Dhulab Ak Krishna Bhakto. Those who search after the knowledge of impersonal Brahman or Loka is Paramatma are certainly accepted as liberated, but due to their imperfect knowledge, they are described in Srimad Bhagavatam as Vimukta Manina. Since their knowledge is imperfect, their conception of liberation is imperfect. Perfect knowledge is possible when one knows the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is supported by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita 5.29. Bhoktaram yajna tapasam sarva loka maheshvaram suridam sarva bhutanam yatvamam shantim brichyati A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the Supreme Lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. Research is going on for the karmis, jnanis, and yogis, but until the search is complete, no one can attain peace. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita says, Gyatva mam shantim richjati. One can actually attain peace when he knows Krishna. This is described in the next verse. Krishna bhakta nishkam ataiva shanta, bukti mukti siddhi kami sakali ashanta. Another famous verse. Because a devotee of Lord Krishna is desireless, he is peaceful. Fruit of workers desire material enjoyment. Jnanis desire liberation, and yogis desire material opulence. Therefore, they are all lusty and cannot be peaceful. Purport. The devotee of Lord Krishna has no desire other than serving Krishna. Even so-called liberated people are full of desires. Fruit of actors desire better living accommodations, and jnanis want to be one with the Supreme. Yogis desire material opulence, yogic perfections, and magic. All of these non-devotees are lusty, kami, because they desire something, they cannot have peace. The peace formula is given by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita in 529. Bhoktaram yajna tapasam sarvaloka maheshwaram suridam sarva bhutanam gyatvamam shantim richiti. One who simply understands that throughout the entire universe, Krishna is the supreme enjoyer and beneficiary of all kinds of sacrifices, penances, and austerities, which should be performed only to attain his devotional service, that Krishna is the supreme being and thus the proprietor of all the material worlds, and that Krishna is the only friend who can actually do good to all living entities, suridam sarva bhutanam, 
One who understands these three principles about Krishna immediately becomes desireless, nishkam, and therefore peaceful. A Krishna bhakta knows that his friend and protector in all respects is Krishna, who is able to do anything for his devotee. Krishna says, Konteya pratijanihi nami bhakta pranashiti. O son of Kunti, declare it boldly that my devotee never perishes. Since Krishna gives the assurance, the devotee lives in Krishna and has no desire for personal benefit. The background for the devotee is the all, is the all good himself. Why should the devotee aspire for something good for himself? His only business is to please the Supreme by rendering as much service as possible. A Krishna Bhakta has no desire for his own personal benefit. He is completely protected by the Supreme. Avashya Rakshibe Krishna Vishvas Palana. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that he is desireless because Krishna will give him protection in all circumstances. It is not that he expects any assistance from Krishna. He simply depends on Krishna just as a child depends on his parents. The child does not know how to expect service from his parents. But he is always protected nevertheless. This is called nishkam, desireless. Isn't that a nice example? The child doesn't know how to expect service from his parents, but he's protected nonetheless. <laughs> Although karmis, jnanis, and yogis fulfill their desires by performing various activities, they are never satisfied. A karmi may work very hard to acquire a million dollars, but as soon as he gets a million dollars, he desires another million. For the karmis, there is no end of desire. The, <clears throat> the more the kar karmi gets, the more he desires. The jnanis cannot be desireless because their intelligence is unsound. They want to merge into the Brahman effulgence, but even though they may be raised to the plat that platform, they cannot be satisfied there. There are many jnanis and sannyasis who, after taking sannyas and giving up the world as false, return to the world and engage in politics and philanthropy or to open schools and hospitals. This means that they could not attain the real Brahman, Brahma Satyam. They have... They have come down to the material platform to engage in philanthropic activity. Thus, they again cultivate desires. And when these desires are exhausted, they desire something different. Therefore, the jnani cannot be nishkam or desireless. Nor can the yogis be desireless, for they desire yogic perfections in order to exhibit some magical feats and gain popularity. People gather around these yogis, and the yogis desire more and more adulation. Because they misuse their mystic power, they fall down again to the material platform. It is not possible for them to become nishkam, desireless. The conclusion is, is, the conclusion is that only the devotees who are simply satisfied in serving the Lord can actually become desireless. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says here, Krishna bhakta nishkam. Since the Krishna bhakta, the devotee of Krishna, is satisfied with Krishna, there is no possibility of fall down. Yes, Gandharvika. So, <clears throat> if we actually see this, um, the real purport of the verse, um, Prabhupada says that one is, um, means I hope this is the right question to ask, but um, only a devotee is des should be desireless and he's peaceful. But uh, I also understand that like even in the beginning stages, we are like unripe mangoes, that example. But um, sometimes, like when we do service or uh, things, when people come together as, no, as other endeavors, there is some agitation. Like, um, is it, how can we say that the devotees are desireless and peaceful? Because if it is peaceful, then everybody who comes in service in Krishna must be like, um, adoring others for doing their service and be peaceful. But sometimes we feel that heat that um, even within devotees, is it because the desire is not set in the proper place? Or why, why do we feel like that? That means we feel a sense of what? A sense of agitation. It's almost agitation. like, yeah, it's almost like doing any other... Uh, it means activity is Krishna consciousness. It's, it's purifying, but the consciousness is not. Well, I can, I mean, I can say some things from personal realization, and also, you know, we can talk about 
what the Shastra says as well. My personal realization is that there's a way in which the ego always wants to um, I'm trying to I remember the word I was using before. It's not usurp, there's another word. Appropriate. The false ego wants to appropriate everything. And whatever one does, beginning in devotional service, then the false ego can come in and say, Oh, that's good. I'll use that for um I'll use that for me to show that I'm a great devotee or something like that. And the in this stage of, of uh devotional service where one is um, still affected by the sense of, of wanting some uh, adulation or something like that for one's service, then there's agitation in the mind because everyone else does too. And that's why there's agitation in the material world generally because everyone's competing for the same spot. And uh, there's a way in which, however, if one actually cultivates a sense that this service is is for Krishna and who cares what anybody else thinks because Krishna knows what it is and it's all I can do anyway. I can't impress other people because they're too busy trying to impress it. <laughs> other people. They're not they're they're trying to show themselves as like, you know, I'm somebody. So why compete anymore? I I, I think there's a point at which when you give up trying to compete actually, uh even if it's just for a moment you can experience for yourself that there's actually peace. And in my experience, it comes from, from uh, deeply hearing and chanting and getting your own taste. Because if you realize, actually, that there's a taste in hearing and chanting and you don't need anything else, uh, that um, <clears throat> why put yourself out for it? You do your duty dutifully, and uh, your only reward you're looking for is more hearing and chanting, actually, and more opportunity to serve. That then there really is no agitation. And if you're around somebody that's in that mode, you'll find that uh, you're not agitated by them. When somebody has, a, a, when the false ego is always trying to appropriate everything, if you're around somebody like that, you'll notice it right away. It's like someone who, who just ate, you know, several pounds of garlic and they walk in the room and all of a sudden it's like, wait, who was that? <laughs> you know, it, it sort of, the, the odor comes out, and so when there's a when there's a sense of uh, of ego that comes out in in one's dealings with others, and and when somebody actually is uh, becoming free of that or is free of it, you'll notice that also, and people do notice. So um, in the beginning, although I take to devotional service, my false ego might appropriate. Uh, whatever I get in devotional service, and there, there, there will be a, some kind of agitation and conflict within my, within my uh, consciousness. So one should uh, learn to uh, perform devotional service, which is um, for the satisfaction of, of the spiritual master, for Krishna, not for oneself. And amazingly, uh, one will have an experience that uh, just as if you put food in the stomach, then automatically everything's okay. Everything's okay. If you serve, you, do, uh, you still get everything. <laughs> you don't, you're not going to miss anything. The false ego says you're going to miss out. But you don't, you don't miss out by surrendering to Krishna and serving Krishna. And it's that conviction and, which is acted upon and the experience that comes from doing it, the complete satisfaction uh, that makes one eager to actually move out of the storm, the storm that comes from the mind's demands and the ego's demands that, you know, get back in the center, you're missing it, you're missing it. And after a while, it, uh, if, if you see the alternative, which is to surrender to Krishna and become um, his servant, it's actually a, a, a beautiful proposition, an alternative. Did it answer your question? Or is there more to it? Yes, Prabhuji. It, it answers my question. Um, I was just... Um, it's just for my... Is, is there a situation like that exists? Like, 
um, within his con that um, like any conversation I mean I'm not saying that everybody like um, everybody agrees to or anything like that but I was just saying that 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 assembly where like everybody appreciates each other and I think it must be really like Naimisharanya. So that's just could be really sweet. I I had an experience when we were in Govardhan this this year during Prabhupada's Tirobhav. That means the uh, day we celebrate every year when our founder Acharya uh, um, left. He left his body and went back to Godhead. So, you know, we get together on that time and have a readings and remembering him and things like that. And there was a, a group of uh, senior disciples who were there at Govardhan, and there were no time restrictions. Yeah. You didn't have to uh, limit yourself to five minutes, ten minutes, or anything. It was like, speak as long as you can. <laughs> and we'll stop when we stop. It worked out fine. And uh, there was, it was palpable that the, there were advanced devotees there, and they were all in this mood of glorifying Prabhupada without... You know, you could sense it that they they weren't put, holding anything back. There were some young devotees there. Afterwards, I talked to a lot of devotees who said it was a phenomenal experience. It was, and even uh, one of the sannyasis was there was telling me. He said, "I have a very high demand for you know that the Krishna Kata that I'm hearing has to be like really on a high level to, for me to keep my interest for that long. And I think we were there for about six hours or seven hours or something like that. And he, and he said everyone had like rapt attention. And he, he was saying, I had rapt attention. He said it was a, like unusual, you know. And the, the level of, of uh, expression that was coming out was so powerful. And there was, there was, we felt as if, I hate to use the cliche, but we were in a bubble. And we were experiencing something unusual. And there was there, and the young devotees that were there. There was a um, a devotee who comes from a, a a devotee family, a young devotee, and hadn't been initiated yet. And he was always he was raised in a family where the, he, his father was a little bit like, uh, "You better be careful. Don't become initiated by anybody because there's only Prabhupada." And there were all these kinds of feelings and and. Uh, he said, after listening to all these glorifications of Prabhupada, he, he said, uh, he, he came up and he, he was, he, actually some tears were coming. He said, I've wasted my whole life. <laughs> I want to you know, surrender and, and become involved. It, it, it was moving. It was a moving experience and we all felt it. And it was because everyone came together. No one was putting themselves in the center. They were, they were glorifying a, a great Vaishnav. And the level of realization was was uh, very high, and and in that kind of assembly, it's there's a possibility of experiencing some this yes, no agitation, just nectar, just happiness, and and that's what we're meant to experience when we hear the verse satam prasangam mamavir yasambido bhavanti hrit karna rasayana kata from Lord Kapila Dev, where he said in this assembly of satam, satam means the hearts are dedicated to, you know, pure devotional service, nothing else. No one's trying to steal the show. Uh, they're, they're truthful, pure devotees. In that kind of assembly, you, you'll experience automatic advancement. Anukramishramiti means step by step. You'll, you'll become advanced uh, just by being in that assembly and hearing. And it's a fact that if you get around somebody who's not motivated, who is actually... Uh, satisfied like this, nishkama, and is uh, <clears throat> talking about Krishna and, it, and teaching about Krishna and so forth, there's a, a weightiness to it. Just as Dhruva Maharaj, when he uh, was, <clears throat> was able through yogic mystic power to actually control the universe, in, in the breathing of the universe. This is possible by yogis. There are subtle laws in the universe and through complete dedication, focus, and concentration on certain elements. There's ways that you actually um, become connected with them in a way that you can manipulate them and so forth. And he was able to do that. And everyone was affected in the whole universe, including the, the demigods who said, uh-oh, another Hiranyakashipu coming here. <laughs> and, uh, and the Lord uh, you know, assured him, no, it's a devotee. It's okay. He's gonna, I'm going to go... Um, 
benedictum and everything. And Prabhupada points out in his purports to that section that one person who has this pure motivation can affect the whole world, just as Juva Maharaj did, can have a, a profound effect on everyone because it's such a weighty thing to move yourself out of the center. And if you have one drop of this intention that I'm going to practice pure devotional service, I don't want, I, I'm noticing that my false ego is appropriating everything. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm practicing um, not identifying with that and actually identifying m with my real self, which is uh, Krishna Das, the servant of Krishna. Someone with that, it, with that motivation is unstoppable. And, uh, and their association is very... Uh, much noticeable. It's noticeable that there's there's a kind of power to it. It's in, it in it's infectious. It is uh, motivating to others and so forth. You can see, and you know, if someone ha just it's a very subtle thing, but we are subtle. The living entity is very subtle. We pick up all these things. P you know, even in the material world, we notice. You know, people know when a cheater is around. Of course, a lot of people want to be cheated, so they don't mind, but. You know, if people notice these subtle things that, you know, such and such was a cheater, such and such is trying to be noticed, and so forth. And, um, you know, it's a whole big boat of people floating in the material ocean. And, but if some person is not motivated in that way, it becomes noticeable. It's a rare thing. That's what's being pointed out here. It's rare. Everyone's either uninterested, either they're, they're not in the program at all, you know, they're either they're like animals. Animals are, and plants and it, all these birds that are being mentioned here are controlled by the modes of material nature. And, you know, when you come out of an egg, you start chirping. And that's what you do. And then, you know, you're going you're gonna to have a bird nature because that's what you've got. And, and there's not a lot of... There's no wiggle room. But when you come to the human form of life, then there's a possibility. But even amongst the human beings, there he's saying there's... There are not that many that are connected to a, a regulated system of religion like Varnashram. And even though those in that system, uh, most of them just talk about it, but they don't actually do it. And amongst those who do it, then there's some that are motivated, and there's very few that aren't. And he's just describing this pure devotee. And we already heard the teachings uh, to Sanatan Goswami that if you just... This is how devotional service begins, that's how it's sustained, and that's one, how one comes to perfection, is by associating with pure devotees. Find a pure devotee and you associate. It's, it's the rarest thing, and you'll get everything from that. You'll get the, um, the rays, as is mentioned in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, in the Nectar Devotion, the rays from the heart of such a person actually have an effect on people who don't even know about devotional service. They can actually start experiencing symptoms of, of uh, advanced symptoms of bhakti because of the, the, the reflected rays that are coming from the hearts of the, uh, a pure devotee and so forth. It's, it's so important. Vishakalila. Here comes the microphone. Hare Krishna, Paul. Um, we were talking about um, the devotees, pure devotees, not having any desires. Um, because whenever there are, there are desires, it actually, and it is not met, it's not fulfilled, then there is an agitation. But what about spiritual desires? Because sometimes I feel, even when the spiritual desires are not fulfilled, there is so much ag agitation, and then there are so many questions in the mind. So should the devotee just not have any desires and just depend on Krishna? Or is it okay for a devotee to develop spiritual desires to serve Well, it's Krishna? not a matter of okay or not okay. Everyone has, every living entity has desire. It's the, it's the symptom of a living entity to have desire. That's, that's our nature. And so then you've made an important distinction that there are material desires and spiritual desires. Material desires are misinformed desires that are disconnected from one's real interest, which is uh, serving Krishna's desires. <laughs> but when one has spiritual desires, um, yes, to, there can be agitation. There is agitation in that also. There's agitation in the spiritual world as well. But 
paradoxically, to our minds, it's the greatest kind of happiness. There's happiness in that, um, in that agitation because uh, it's, um, <clears throat> it's not material, it's spiritual. There's no, um, there's no reaction from that. And it's, it's actually, uh, there are spiritual emotions which are meant to serve Krishna. And there, there's a sense of, even in the spiritual world, there's a sense of competition amongst the uh, devotees. Uh, however, there's no envy. And that is that one sees another devotee doing better service and then has that sort of a pang that, oh, why couldn't I do that well? But it, uh, there's at simultaneously, Prabhupada said, an appreciation for the other person's service that they're serving Krishna so nicely. But then there's an impetus that let me do well, but, but the, the main interest is let Krishna be served nicely. The, the clamor is, is not that I should be noticed for my service, but that I could have served Krishna better, therefore there's a competition. And so Krishna is completely the center. And all the emotions are there, and we see that, uh, I mean, Rupa Goswami goes through this in the Nectar of Devotion and explains how all the, uh, all the emotions, when connected to devotional service, they're all spiritual. I should say, the original emotions are all spiritual. When they become covered by the intention to enjoy separately from Krishna, then they become material emotions, and they cause grief and agitation. But that those inebrieties are not there in the spiritual agitation. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay. And now we have... Okay, any other questions or points? I'll read one more verse, and then I promised I was going to talk about goal setting. I hope that's not too abrupt after all this philosophy. Um, but it's getting close to the end of the year, and it's a good time to talk about setting goals. Let's see what the next verse looks like, and then, okay, here's an important verse. This is verse 150. Muktanam apisidhanam narayana parayanaha sudurlaba prashantatma kotishwapi mahamune. O great sage, out of many millions of materially liberated people who are free from ignorance, and out of many millions of siddhas who have nearly attained perfection, there is hardly one pure devotee of Narayan. Only such a devotee is actually completely satisfied and peaceful. Purport, this verse is quoted from the Srimad Bhagavatam 6.14.5. The Narayana Parayana, the devotee of Lord Narayan, is the only blissful person. One who becomes a Narayana Parayana is already liberated from material bondage. He already possesses all the perfections of yoga. Unless one comes to the platform of Narayana Parayana and passes over the platform of Bhukti Mukti Siddhi. Bhukti means, I want to enjoy the something for myself. Mukti means I want to renounce the world and become God. And Siddhi means I practice yoga for some, getting some mystic power. Unless he uh, passes over this Bhukti Mukti Siddhi platform, he cannot fully be satisfied. That, um, that is the pure devotional stage. Anyabilashitam Anyabilashita shunyam jnana karma nyanavritam anukulyena krishna nushilanam bhaktirutama. One who desires nothing but Krishna and who is not influenced by the process of jnana mark, cultivation of knowledge, actually becomes free from ignorance. A first class person is one who is not influenced by karma, fruit of activity, or yoga, mystic power. He simply depends on Krishna and is satisfied in his devotional service. According to Srimad Bhagavatam 6.17.28, Narayana para sarve na kutashchana bibhyati. Such a person is never afraid of anything. For him, heaven and hell are the same. Not knowing the situation of a Narayana parayana, rascals become envious. By the grace of Narayana, a devotee is situated in the most opulent position in the material world. Rascals are envious of Narayan and his devotees, but the devotee endeavors to please another devotee of Narayan because he knows that by pleasing Narayan's representative, one directly pleases Lord Narayan. 
Therefore, devotee offers the best comforts and facilities to his spiritual master. Outsiders who have no knowledge of Narayan are envious of both Narayan and his devotee. Consequently, when they see that Narayan's devotee is opulently situated, they, became, they become even more envious. But when the devotee of Narayan asks such foolish people to come to live with him in the same comfortable situation, they do not agree because they cannot give up illicit sex, meat-eating, intoxication, and gambling. Therefore, the materialist refuses the company of a Narayana Parayana, although he is envious of the devotee's material situation. In Western countries, when ordinary men, storekeepers and workers, see our devotees living and eating sumptuously and yet not working, they become very eager to know where they get the money. Such people become envious and ask, how is it possible to live so comfortably without working? How is it that you have so many cars, bright faces, and nice clothes? Not knowing that Krishna looks after his devotees, such people become surprised and some become envious. Hare Krishna. Now, it's, um, it's getting close to the end of the year, and this is a, a, a very good time. May I do this now? Yes. Okay. This is a very good time to start turning one's attention towards uh, <clears throat> goals for, for, for one's uh, life, various types of goals. And also reflecting back on how the last year went. Good juncture. So take some time. Find some time when you can. Uh, you ha it takes a little time. You can't just do it in, in an instant because we're moving so fast. And there's so many ideas and thoughts and plans and worries that are coming into our mental system in every minute that if you just stop suddenly and uh, I can't think of anything. Uh, let's just do what we did last year. It's, it's all right. But take some time to unwind. If you can, take a few days off and go by yourself or with uh, your spouse or, you know, or, you know to, to, to take some time just to reflect and think about what you've done. Uh, have, it's good to have a very strong spiritual practice on those days so you can be you know, centered and peaceful and, and start in the morning, have very strong. And then take some time. You can just sit and... Um, and Say, say, let's say, let's just say you're married and you, you, you have a relationship where you can talk to your spouse. Um, you can sit down and begin discussing, uh, you know, how did things go last year? And it's amazing, actually, to recount all the things that went on and reflect back. You have to take the experiences and, and find, remember what happened to you during the year. Uh, where were the highs? Where were the lows? Where, the, where were the mistakes? You, uh, where were the points where you did really well that you've forgotten about? And right now you're feeling low self-esteem, but actually you had a really good year and there were things about it that were really wonderful. Go back and collect those things up. Remember, remember, remember. It means to bring them back. Bring them back and connect to them and think about it. It's your life and there are all these things going on in your life. Don't just fly through and forget about it. Interesting, I got a, a letter from my sister who has pancre pancreatic cancer. I'm going to see her in a couple of days, next week. And, uh, and she just, you know how people write a, a little newsletter for the, and they send it out for, for the holidays. And in it, she was mentioning that, um, she, you know, that she probably has about six months. And um, <clears throat> then she was saying, you know, when you have six months, you start thinking about all the things that you should have done, <laughs> that you shouldn't have hold, held back. She was actually saying, you know, she, she felt grateful for her life because there are a lot of things that she has been able to do and so forth. But then she said, um, when you only have six months, the, the likelihood is that you won't be well enough to actually do what you need to do. So don't, don't wait. And there's, a, there's a, uh, the law of forced efficiency. And that is, I know this all the time because I travel a lot, that when the travel date comes and the cab's going to come, to take me to the airport. That's like the most, that's the hardest deadline there is. The airplane, in fact, I have dreams sometimes that I'm running for a plane and I can't find my ticket or something. Like that. <laughs> but I know like I'm getting ready early in the morning, the cab's coming and you got to get in the cab. The cab's, tick, the, the thing's ticking and everything like that. 
I get really efficient the, the, the last few days before I'm about to travel. Okay, I'm doing it now. It's a boom, boom, boom. You start doing it. We can uh, do those things. We can be more efficient in our life if we, if we voluntarily set goals for ourselves and timelines for things that we want to get done. And it makes a much more productive life materially and spiritually. Sankhya purvaka namagana nati bi kalavasani krito. The Goswamis of Vrindavan set goals and they counted how much they were doing their bhajan every day and so forth. And, and um, <clears throat> when we do it too, we actually grow and we have um, progress. We get progress. So... Your mind needs a target. If your mind doesn't have a target, it becomes morose. And Prabhupada mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita. And as soon as you have a target, the second you have a target to shoot for, the mind starts thinking how to do it. It's miraculous. As soon as you set a, a, an objective and you say, I'm going, to obtain, I'm going to reach this goal within a certain amount of time, even if you sit down and you're drinking a glass of grapefruit juice, your mind will start calculating how you're going to reach that goal. And as soon as you go to sleep, you'll start, even the mind will be calculating at that time how to reach the goal. So um, <clears throat> decide on your own goals. Don't let them be forced upon you. Don't let them be uh, imposed upon you by nature and so many things. You get to decide. You make the decision. And um, <clears throat> then your purpose can be strong. So that's one of the first points is that you must have strong purpose. And as soon as you set some goals that are very meaningful to you, your life will have more purpose in it. Juva Maharaj had a strong purpose, didn't he? You know the story of Juva Maharaj. He, he, his purpose was so strong, even his spiritual master came and said, go home, this is not the time, you know, you're too young and everything. So forget it, I'm going. You have to be like that. And so you have to have something that, that you're really eager to, to go for, besides just the status quo, besides the things that you have to do because... You know, you've been forced into it by the laws of material nature. And uh, prioritize. It, take time. It's your, it's your life. You can prioritize and decide what are the things that are most important to you. As Stephen Covey used to say, the ma- just always remember that the main thing is the main thing. <laughs> Keep the main thing the main thing. Don't get into all these other extra things that aren't really important. Find out what the main thing is to you. If you don't know what the main thing is, like people ask you, what's your main thing in life? And you don't know, you're in trouble. And then, uh, then you get to practice persistence. And that's one of the best teachers in the world is persistence. That uh, I've watched people. I remember I had an experience once when I was at O'Hare Airport distributing books back in the probably early 80s or late 70s. And uh, it was a terrible night. Usually it was great Friday night. For some reason, everything was going wrong. And uh, no one was stopping. And uh, I was starting to think, oh, it's not worth it. I'm not going to try as hard. And there was one devotee out there that usually didn't do so well in distributing books. But I just saw him. He kept persisting. And I have to admit, there was something in my mind I was thinking, ah, you know, he won't succeed. He's trying so hard. <laughs> He's not going to do anything. If I can't do it, he can't do it. You know, that was the sort of the, the cynical mind thinking like that and then we all got in the Sankirtan van we're driving home and he had done huge and better than anyone else and back then it was like a really big thing you know who did what at, you know and so forth and, and it always marked me I thought never again am I listening to you in your cynical ways I'm going to persist and, and, and so this persistence is very powerful if you can apply that in your life to simple things simple tasks things that look like they're impossible to do if you, if you have a goal and you prioritize and your purpose is strong, you can persist. And you can uh, wear holes in stone through persistence. Prabhupada used to say, drops a day, wear the stone away. And it's a fact. If you're just persistent at something, like practicing, you want to just, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are, you say, I'm going to learn this new skill. So if you persist, after a while, you'll get good. And, you know... Other cynics will be looking, ah, he'll never get good. Oh, what happened? You know, now he's a high court judge and so forth. It's very inspiring when people persist and it's very powerful. Um, 
Regarding procrastination, a couple of quotes that I really like. It's amazing how long it takes to complete something that you're not working on. (laughs) The trouble with doing nothing is that you never know when you're finished. (laughs) There's a lot about procrastination, but it's it's one of the great enemies of our lives. And uh, when I was contemplating my goals, Nirkula and I go away always for at least three or four days at the end of the year. Uh, and, and we just take time to really write down our goals and think about how we did last year and so forth. I had, I'm just doodling in one, of my, in one of my books where I you know, think and I write on the paper and stuff. And I, one of the things, uh, uh, phrases I had written was a zero, a zero procrastination policy, which means war on the mind, war on the mind and procrastination. You have to declare war on procrastination. And if you're not declaring war on procrastination... He'll come and just take over your whole system and ruin your life. Just ruin your life. And then you'll end up in that last six-month period and I'll think, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I, ah, you know. And so fight procrastination. Fight the righteous fight. Some reasons people don't set goals. They don't have good reasons to set goals. You have to have reasons. In other words, if you, have, if you can prioritize and come up with things that you really want to attain and you, you have a strong purpose, then you'll then set goals. Uh, another is that they don't know how effective it is. It's so effective. It's, it's like magic. They don't know how. Another is they fear they might fail. Uh, and five, they feel overwhelmed being too busy or too and disorganized. These are some reasons. There may be many more. But uh, human beings have a built-in goal-setting tendency. Uh, Prop had set all kinds of goals for himself and uh, was very regulated and determined at, at achieving them, uh, and miraculous things happened. I mean, he had these goals to start a, a worldwide society, and he started while well, he was in India, and he failed and he came to America, and it looked like he was going to fail again, but he persisted because his purpose was so strong, unbreakable. And look what happened. I mean, it's amazing what you can do if you just persist. And sometimes it may look like nothing's going to happen, you know, and, and most people think, you know, like, don't try so hard, don't, you know, don't keep persisting. But you have to have your own internal reason why you're going for it and have that strong goal. So set these goals. One, uh, there are many different kinds of goals, which obviously I'm not going get, to get to tonight, so take this as an introductory uh, to something else we'll take up more in the beginning of January. One very uh, powerful way to set goals is to set 30-day goals. 30-day goals are so amazing. Just like when Kartik, uh, a lot of devotees come and they set spiritual goals for Kartik, and then they feel their self-esteem, spiritual self-esteem goes way up. Kartik is a special month, 30 days during which the devotees, uh, it's a, you get extra credit for your spiritual activities. So devotees concentrate their, uh, their goals on that month. But you can do it any month. And it doesn't have to be huge, but if you do something even small and you say, for 30 days I'm going to do this, and you write it down on paper. The thing about the 30-day goal is, it's long enough so you can actually start a new habit in your life, and it's short enough that you can see the end of it so you can actually persist and tolerate and do that. So why not set 30-day goals? I mean, who can stop you? That's the excited th- exciting thing about this. No one can prevent you from moving ahead with your life and changing yourself, and you can do it. That's what's exciting about being a human being and different from being a spider or an alligator or something like that. You can actually decide to do this and, and go for it. Um, <clears throat> okay, a few goal-setting tips. I'm going to go through this quickly, and we'll come back to these at another class. But here, here's one of the most powerful pieces of advice about goal-setting, that I, a mantra that I picked up from Jim Rohn, who is a fantastic motivational speaker. And his, he said, decide what you want and write it down. Decide what you want and write it down. And as soon as you do that, you've manifested from the subtle to the gross. It's starting to manifest itself in physical form, and it'll grow from there. And that is such a powerful process, first deciding what you want. So like as a family, or say, you know, you get together and you say, what do we want? It's like, I don't know. You better decide. 
And if you ask an individual, what do you want? And they say, I'm not sure. Or they have some very, um, you know, uh, superfluous kind of idea about what they want. They're in trouble. They don't have the right thing. Anchor yourself with what you really want. Decide what you want. That's a big thing. You have to take time to do this. Decide what you really want in your life. Then write it down. The the United States... uh, the Constitution of the United States is written down. You know what? If they didn't write it down, if Ben Franklin and all those Thomas Jefferson and all those founding fathers of America didn't write it down, we wouldn't be sitting in America right now, I guarantee you. <laughs> there would be no America. The reason that they, they thought it up, they said, let's come up with this plan for a country that you know, everyone has freedom and you know, the government has balance to it. There's no more king and all this kind of stuff. And they, they just thought it up. And they said, this would be ideal, and it will be one nation under God. Let's write it down. So they all sat together, and they said, let's and put that in, and put that in. What about Thomas's thing? Yeah, Jefferson, get over here. Put your thing in here. And then, you know, they put it all together, and then they said, okay, we're signing it, you know. This is our thing. This is what we're sticking to. Liberty, give me liberty or give me death. And they wrote it down, and they put it up on the wall, and it's still there in Washington, D.C., and that's what the whole country's founded on, a whole country with streets and roads and a legal system. It's all based on that document. That's where it all came from. And your life is like that, too. You get to decide. Decide what you want and write it down and make it your document. If you don't have your own declaration of independence on your wall, you're not getting the most out of life that you can. So this is the time of year. It's dark outside. It's time for reflection. The light's going to come soon. The plants are going to come out and uh, you know, be enlivened by the sun rays that, that will be uh, coming in as the days lengthen. And we should also, time now to, to dig deep and find out what it is uh, that's prior, what are those priorities in our life and make sure they're written down and then put them in a visible place. There's a lot more in this that's that's really exciting about goal setting. Those are a couple things for now. And even that one mantra, decide what you want and write it down, can get you started in the goal setting process. Do it. Take the time. And uh, your year will be completely different than if you don't do this. Don't just go drifting. Set a, set a sail by writing this down and deciding what you want to achieve. And you'll be propelled through the whole year in a very powerful way. Go pray, manande, Aribo. So we thank everyone tonight for coming to this yagya. This was a yagya to come here and sit to hear transcendental sound vibration, to chant Hare Krishna, and uh, everyone will be eternally blessed for just for this one activity. And now we're going to move on to the next section, which will be a, a kirtan, Hare Krishna, Haribo. Nachari ar marman, nachari ar marman, nachari ar marman, nachari ar marman, hey, nachari ar marman, nachari ar marman, nachari ar marman, nachari ar marman.